it's, it's great to be uh, here and have the opportunity to uh, say a few words. Uh, before uh, Janie comes and asks me uh, tricky questions, I, I thought I'd just give you a quick uh, view of the world from, uh, from our perspective, uh, and then we can drill into, into more detail. I mean, obviously, if we start very wide and look at the, the global scene, uh, you, you see as much as uh, I do about I never thought I'd be living in a world where the President of the United States would be putting out a tweet saying he ordered uh, US businesses not to do business with China. That's a pretty extreme situation. Uh, you got we're, we're, poor old uh, Boris is having a, a reasonably tough time over in the UK. But I, I think the one thing that, one of the things it demonstrates is the real uh, consequences of political uncertainty when it comes to the, to, to the broader economy. If you think of the UK, just two, three years now of just chronic uncertainty about what's going on, what's going to happen, and, and the influence that that has on investment. And uh, so if we come to, to New Zealand, uh, yep, there's all sorts of uh, global headwinds, and, and I'm sure the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister talked about that at great length, and they're always talking about the global headwinds. But actually, when you look at what's happening in New Zealand right now, uh, our terms of trade are at historic high levels. We should be doing well. We should be booming as a country right here, right now. Uh, the world wants our goods. Uh, we're, we're producing good quality stuff, and there's huge opportunities for New Zealand to be doing well. And instead, what we've seen is, is a sharp decline in growth in New Zealand. And one of the primary drivers of that is the, the, the chronic domestic uh, business uh, well, the, the lock of, lack of business confidence and that, what, and what's been driving that? It's not, uh, you know, there's an element of international stuff, of course, but primarily it's around uh, the, the, the local policy description that we've seen the last couple of years, where we've got uh, uh, three things, I think, really driving that drop in business confidence. One is uh, continually adding costs to business, and I'm sure you're conscious of that, but, you know, uh, particularly in the industrial relations space as well, uh, everybody wants people to have higher wages, but if you just arbitrarily put minimum wage up 27% over three years, uh, businesses struggle to cope, cope with that, frankly, particularly if you're an exporter or if you're you know, offering discretionary goods, which people don't have to buy. Uh, and uh, so adding costs, secondly, creating uncertainty. We've got 230-odd working groups, so everything's been tossed up into the air. I mean, the biggest one, of course, was a capital gains tax for 18 months. Uh, the natural reaction for people... Uh, who would be investing, and we, you know, we know we only get jobs, growth, opportunity, uh, and the ability to you know, get good, satisfying work if somebody somewhere makes an investment, puts their hand in their pocket, takes a risk. Well, the most logical thing to do when there's so much uncertainty uh, political is to keep your hands in your pocket and wait until the dust settles. And uh, when enough people are doing that across an economy, it slows it down. Combined with that, with the way that some of the business, uh, some of the big decisions have been made, uh, that also causes uh, uncertainty. You think of the oil and gas decision. Now you can argue about the merits of that, but you know, there's only two countries in the world that we've been able to find who think they're so rich that they don't need to look for oil and gas. Uh, it's New Zealand, and uh, the other one is France. Uh, I'll rest my case on that. But uh, the, the, uh, despite the merits of it, the way that the decision was made, with no analysis no attempt to work out the economic consequences of it uh, was a frightening thing. And so a lot of people will be asking the question, is my industry going to be next uh, when the Prime Minister needs a speech? Uh, the other thing, of course, the, the other element of uncertainty, which I was talking to somebody about last night, is uh, it's very hard for people to discern the, the direction of travel for the government. Of course, when you talk about well-being, everybody, you know, everybody b believes in well-being, and there's never been a budget in the history of the country that hasn't been focused on the well-being of New Zealanders. But if, 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 if the rhetoric of a government is all uh, uh, hard to define and, and um, sort of loose and vague, uh, then that adds its own uncertainty as well, because people are trying to work out, well, what does that actually mean? What does that mean for me and my business uh, and for me and my family? Uh, and so uh, the combination of uh, added costs and uncertainty uh, uh, have, have driven down that confidence. The third thing, and I don't like to be unkind, but it is incompetence uh, in the way that the government's gone about a couple of things. And Kiwi Build is the classic, uh, where I remember Phil Twyford so many saying, you know, everybody else is an idiot, we're going to fix the housing crisis, we're going to do this, we're going to build the houses, and they just haven't. Uh, transport's another area where they've come in, cancelled a whole lot of projects that were ready to go, replaced them with a whole lot of projects that aren't ready to go and won't be ready to go for five years. So uh, that combination, I think, is, is, is a broad concern from, our, from a broader economic point of view. 
time when we should be doing well, we're actually slowing. And uh, uh, of course, you know, with so much uncertainty internationally, we, we need to be strong at a time uh, like this so that we can fight our way through difficult times ahead. Uh, now, the, so the, the other thing before Jenny comes up was, of course, a couple of weeks ago we released our economy discussion document. It was the fourth of uh, eight that we're planning to do this year in the middle of the three-year terms, give a bit of an outline of where we're heading, what we're trying to do. Uh, uh, we're not announcing all our, uh, our policies right now. Obviously, we're still a year away from the election. But the three basic elements of it uh, were first around the, uh, around the tax at tax and spending sort of framework, and none of that should come as a surprise for you, the National Party, we stand, we, we, we want taxes to be as low as possible, uh, low rate, broad base, uh, we, we've already announced that we want to adjust tax rates automatically for inflation, uh, so that we're not taking a little nibble every extra year, and we want to be much more disciplined with our spending around uh, having clear targets uh, for what we're going to spend our money on. Uh, and we, 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 in, in that context, we talked about putting the age of superannuation up in 20 years' time, just so that we can ensure that that uh, wonderful system that we have, universal superannuation, is affordable in the long term. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one area. The second area is around trying to deal with that long-standing challenge we've had as a country around productivity. Uh, we, we fell off the pace in the 70s and 80s and have been about 30% 30, 30 behind Australia in, in the top half of the OECD for a long time. The good news is that we haven't continued to keep falling off the pace, but we haven't been able to catch up, and we've just remained in that, in that position. And so the real challenge for us as a country is to try and uh, close that gap more effectively. We closed it a little bit in the last few years, but nowhere near as much as we need to. So uh, we, we, we had, um, and you would have heard no doubt many long speeches from Stephen Joyce and co in the past about the business growth agenda, and th th but that was just our way of, of breaking down the challenge to say, well, what do businesses need access to grow and to become more productive? Well, you need access to good quality capital markets first. You need access to good skilled framework, uh, um, export markets, natural resources, good quality infrastructure, and a knowledge framework. And uh, so we've out, sort of outlined that, and we've, we've made a, a series of proposals in, in each of those areas, and we can talk about any of them that we want to. Uh, but um, so that people can see a clear plan uh, focused on building growth in this country and, and lifting that growth level. Uh, so that's that. The third area, though, is a slightly different uh, and, and, and new uh, in the sense of having an equal focus on uh, the costs for New Zealand families and indeed the cost structure of the New Zealand economy. Because it's all very well if you've doubled your income, but if your cost of housing has tripled, uh, you haven't made so much progress. And uh, so we, 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 we've outlined a series of areas where we're really focusing on that uh, cost structure for the New Zealand families. Uh, whether it's on the cost of housing, and you know, fundamentally there, it's about trying to reduce the cost of building new houses so that people can be more affordable, which is RMA reform, but also in the competition area and a whole host of areas, that are details that we need to work on there. Uh, petrol prices, all those sorts of, uh, uh, and, and when you talk about petrol taxes, uh, we've committed not to, to take away the Auckland one and, and be more uh, focused in that area. But the, but the area of regulation is a, a big part of, of my focus, certainly. When you think of it, uh, New Zealand governments in the past have been actually, I think of the nine years of John Key and, and, and Bill English, very disciplined around spending money, uh, around the fiscal side of uh, government. So if government's going to sp uh, spend a, a million dollars, quite di very disciplined. Where, where, where there's a real opportunity in the next uh, national government that I hope we can get to form is to try and translate that same discipline to the regulatory side of what we do. Because in so many instances, uh, we, we, we haven't been as disciplined about imposing a million dollars cost on, 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 on industries and, um, uh, and on families uh, through, through uh, ill thought, through uh, regulation. And uh, so we've got all these processes in place for regulatory impact statements, uh, but they are very hit and miss. And the real cost benefit analysis is very hit and miss. And so, you know, uh, the most egregious examples recently, of course, have been, <coughs> have been that oil and gas decision where there, there wasn't even, even an attempt uh, to, to work out the cost. Uh, actually, just this last week, uh, we've, uh, we've had major announcements about uh, water standards. And everybody, of course, wants to improve the quality of our water. Uh, but 
when you look at the, the quality of the analysis to try and work out the consequences of, of uh, the economic consequences of it, uh, the, the work is still nowhere near uh, complete in order to make a, a, a rational judgment about that in terms of the impact of our economy and, and our way of life. And so I think that, that that is an area of huge opportunity. And of course, I think it's highly relevant to you and your work. Uh, you've been uh, confronted with a huge amount of regulation over the last few years. And uh, you know we do need to be very conscious and careful of the fact that uh, ultimately, a lot of those costs flow through to your consumers, customers, and New Zealanders. Uh, and so we've got to be very disciplined about uh, asking ourselves, have we got it right? Uh, and are we uh, going about it in a restrained and careful way uh, so that every cost that we impose is fully justified and is achieving what it sets out to achieve? So anyway, that's uh, by way of introduction and um, very keen to have, have a more informal chat uh, and answer some of your questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, oh, good I can effort. See them now. <laughs> yeah, good effort for making it out um, this morning. After what I hear was a really great dinner and whiskey bar as well. I'm not sure if everyone here was, was sort of the, the main people at the whiskey bar. I'm assuming not, but but maybe. Paul, good to good to see you too. We usually talk um, down the corridors at Parliament when I'm part of a mob of media chasing politicians <coughs> for sound bites. So it's good to have a, a good chunk of time to have a chat. It's like, it, it, if you've seen the nat nature programs of, of uh, the salmon swimming up a stream uh, in Canada and there are grizzly bears on the side, um, and that's what you feel like in Parliament. You're just a little salmon, you're going through, the grizzly bears are on the side and you're just hoping that they're not going to ask you anything, and sometimes they do, and yeah. you tend to cause trouble when you do. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a different sort of rules about you know social etiquette in, in that sort of um, space, but... <laughs> Anyway, I wanted, the first question I wanted to ask you was actually um, in relation to a comment that Sir John Key made a year ago. Um, during a media interview, he said that some of the factors that had driven the economy during his leadership were either reducing or coming off the table. And the factors he mentioned were high migration growth, high house price growth, and growth in China. Sir John said that the challenge for the government was to try to think of new factors to stimulate the economy. If you were in government, what would replace some of those those drivers? Yeah, look, um, I think I think the most important thing is in government is to do the basics well, and uh, it's not for us to determine, you know, what 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 are the, the the next opportunities for New Zealand. I mean, no no bureaucrat or politician would have sat down and think, um, you know, we should get into rockets. Uh, or you know, we should get into um, software like Zero or so forth. Uh, it's about creating an environment where people feel confident to invest, uh, and uh, international flows of capital can come into New Zealand. And so I think, you know, fundamentally, the most important thing to do is is to, uh, to govern in a way uh, that people feel confident. They can look at the, the state of the books and say, "Yep, it's all sustainable. We're not going to fall off a cliff. What we're doing is not uh, unsustainable." Uh, they have some predictability about the policy uh, settings. Uh, you've signalled where we're heading, and we're not veering off in a wild direction that nobody can predict. Uh, and and that we're we're opening uh, we're open to people coming in. And then if we, if we do that for an extended period of time, then uh, then the economy sure. looks after itself, and people invest and take opportunities. That that I think is the most important thing. You can come up with all sorts of particular little schemes and plans, but that's the core uh, um, activity of good government. If we just look at one of those factors being migration, and that is something that has really spurred growth in New Zealand, uh, Treasury's projections are for that to, to drop right off. If you were in government, would that be an area that you would like to focus on to sort of keep those levels elevated at where they are now at about uh, 60,000 people net per year? Well, uh, tr Treasury always predicts that it's going to drop back to the mean. That, that's their standard approach. So every, every uh, all, all right through the whole period when it was going up, they were always predicting it was going to go back down. And so that, that's just their kind of model, which is a strange one. Uh, look, I think the, th the thing that most New Zealanders would expect is that we would be uh, focused on the immigration sense on bringing in the skills that we need. Uh, and uh, you just about go to just about any business at your name and they're, they're crying out for skills. Uh, now, there's two elements to that. We've obviously got to ensure that New Zealanders uh, are encouraged and, and equipped to work, 
uh, but there is, there's still always going to be the need for immigration. So I wouldn't want to put a figure on it, but uh, we need to have uh, open enough gates so that we can get the skills that we need. But we shouldn't, um, you know, I don't think there's a, a, a magic number. Sure. And, uh, you know, you've also got to balance the, the ability uh, to be able to cope in terms of infrastructure and, and, and housing. And so getting the pace right, you know, I think there's no question that it was, it was going uh, a bit faster than we could handle for a couple of years there. And so we've got to get that. That, you know, just get it into a reasonable balance. Okay, something I would like to ask you to put a figure on is where you believe the government's debt to GDP <laughs> should be. So this now, is kind of a, a, a discussion that we've had a lot um, with this government. They've yeah, put well, targets yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah, 20%, yeah, and, yeah, then, no, and, well, and um, about a couple of weeks ago you said to me that 20% was about right. What, 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 we haven't sort of come up with our, form, you know, in the election year we, we'll come up with a particular figure and you can get all hung up about whether it's 20% or 18 or 19 or whatever and I, I don't, we're not going to come up with a particular figure right now. The, the point that we were making and um, was kind of mischaracterised by uh, some in the media was to say we're on the same page as the Labour Party, which we're not quite because... But 20% is on the, on the same page? Yeah, but, no, but what they've done is they, they, they came in and they said we're going to keep debt to 20% of GDP and then halfway along they'd said, oh, no, actually, we're going to change it from 15 to 25. Uh, and the cynic, and most of us say, well, that means they're going to 25, uh, and, uh, which is a very significant increase in debt. And uh, so we, 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 we're, not, uh, we're not in that camp. We don't actually think uh, right now uh, is a time for a very significant increase in debt, uh, but um, we haven't come up with a, a specific uh, level. The question, of course, is, is not so much you can get you can get sort of focused on, on the level of debt. And New Zealand's government debt is actually quite low in international terms, and so it's not an immediate crisis. Uh, but our private sector debt is quite high, and that's why we've kept government debt low. But it's the quality of what you spend the money on is of the course. critical thing. Uh, and uh, so that's the real issue. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's about... Um, it's about delivering on projects, and we're seeing a bit of a lack of that at the moment, and uh, good quality decision making in terms of what you're spending the money on. And as, as I indicated at the start, our real issue as a country at the moment is uh, infrastructure. Over the next two or three years, we're not going to be spending anywhere near as much as we should be on infrastructure because, for ideological reasons, the government's cancelled a whole lot of projects that were ready to go and doesn't have anything to replace them with because you know, it takes years to get a slow tram rambling down Dominion Road, uh, even if it made sense, which it doesn't. Okay, look, I'm, I'm interested in this um, issue of government debt, partly because Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr, uh, when he cut the OCR by twice as much as we all expected, explicitly said government businesses, households need to go out and spend because monetary policy has sort of done a lot since the GFC to stimulate economies around the world and Governor Orr as well as the likes of the IMF and um, other sort of economic commentators around the world are saying that it's time for fiscal policy for, to, to sort of do its bit to stimulate the economy. So yeah. I'm just wondering <coughs> where, where you sit on that because the only way we can, New Zealand can do that is if we... Yep, borrow a, more. A, a, and the broad question is where should we be at the moment and the, the point I made right at the start is New Zealand... Uh, right, we have incredibly high inter historic terms of trade. We're getting good income from, our, from what we sell in the world at the moment. We should be doing well. This is not a time when we should be sort of having the fire hoses out trying to uh, necessarily stimulate uh, the world. So, I mean, so we look, shouldn't be trying to stimulate well, at the moment? I think what we should be doing is making sure that we're doing, like I say, getting those basics right and restoring confidence and reviving, uh, reviving confidence uh, across the board so that you know, people feel confident to invest. Uh, I mean, I think the, you know, the real issue with the, uh, the interest rate cuts is that you know, there's no question that it reduces demand uh, from savers because uh, you know, we, we all know people who have been relying on, on their savings uh, and are getting incredibly low returns at the moment. So you, you, you'd be doing that on the basis that you'd expect that the increase in spending and investment from the low interest rates will offset that. But of course the real danger is that if, because confidence is so low, you don't get that investment and you don't get that spending, the overall effect could be negative. And so that's why it's so important for, for there to be a you know, much more um, confidence-inspiring leadership from government at the moment. Sure. Okay, um, Paul, I just want to talk about conduct and culture now. So obviously this is a pretty big theme for uh, yeah. the industry. And the FMA CEO, Rob Everett, yesterday said that New Zealand was a bit behind the ball in this regard. As a former Commerce and Consumer Affairs Minister in 2014 yep. to 16, 
Do you think you could have done more in the space? Oh, look, we, well, of course, we introduced uh, in, under the national government uh, the Financial Markets Conduct Act, you know, enormous uh, regulation of this uh, whole sector, uh, partly in response to the whole financial markets crisis uh, earlier on. And uh, I think that was a, you know, a significant move. It was, you know, it was a big call for us because you know, our basic instinct is one of regulatory restraint. Uh, we, we're pretty cautious about adding uh, high levels of regulation, but there were areas where it you know, clearly needed to be done. Uh, around um, conflicted advice and uh, also just you know bringing y your industry into um, being as open as they can. I mean, I, you know, I still, you know, there were definitely issues. I, I remember in the KiwiSaver space, for example, you know, annual statements coming out saying that th this is your fee for the year, and that was a complete misrepresentation of the fee. It was just the $30 a year standard fee and no reference to all the other fees. Uh, and so th there were practices that needed to change. Uh, so I think we've made a lot of progress, um, but uh, so uh, the, the broader issue is that we've just got to be you know, mindful of always asking the question uh, when we add another layer of regulation and another layer of cost to any industry, ultimately most of that filters through to the consumers the people that you're working for, the people who are trying to uh, raise money or do whatever they do. And so you've always got to be uh, assure yourself that uh, that ex extra cost is actually adding value and improving the outcomes for, for everybody. Sure. Uh, I, I just want to say life insurance uh, commissions, that's been a, a real focus yep. of the FMA and seems to be the, the issue that's trying to be worked through at the moment. Yep. Um, back in 2016, a couple of scathing reports by Melville Jessup Weaver and the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research sort of put the spotlight on those things, and at the time you said you favoured a greater disclosure regime yep. versus um, capping or yep. banning commissions. Is that still your view? Well, um, uh, well, I mean, let's see what you know the government comes up with in its, in its area. I think as a first step, uh, disclosure is always the, the, the best way uh, to, to make it open so people know what they're dealing with. And you've got to be conscious of the fact that uh, everywhere you go across the whole economy, uh, there are positions of conflicted advice and, and uh, um, asymmetries of information, uh, you know, everywhere you look, every time you go to the dentist, it's the same situation, you go, oh, my flaming teenage son scrapped up the car last week, um, you know, a little Toyota Corolla, I went to get three quotes from panel beaters, one for 700, one for 1500, one for 3000, uh, and uh, there's an information asymmetry and uh, there's a conflict of interest, uh, and that, that goes right throughout the economy. Uh, and so uh, we've just got to be, just got to be mindful that, yes, we recognise uh, challenges in every industry, uh, and we, we work our way through it and um, try and work our way through it in a clear and logical way fashion so that when you're, like I say, we've added an enormous amount of regulation and complexity to this sector already. Uh, if we keep on piling it on, uh, we've got to assure ourselves at every stage that we're really genuinely adding value. And the other thing I would just say around the regulatory space is the most important sort of theme of it should be the regulations should be clear uh, and they should be enforced. Uh, the, the worst outcome is you have an, a, a great um, suite of, of costly regulations that aren't properly enforced, uh, that just add cost and we're not actually anywhere anywhere ahead. It's better to be uh, a little bit more focused, uh, lots of clarity and rigorous enforcement so people know where they stand and they can get on with it. Do you believe the FMA should have the power through legislation to regulate for conduct and culture? Well, that's the, uh, that's the debate we're having and, and I think they've got to make their case. You know, they've still, still got to make that case. So... So you, you're not convinced? Well, I've got an open mind. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just how far you extend it. Uh, during talking about the institutions, uh, uh, ha ha how far you, you put into legislation expectations around um, uh, um, you know, things that are hard to define, you know, I don't know. Let, let, let's, see, let's see them make their case. Because um, you know, ultimately, you only stay in business if you give customers what they want. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so any business has to be focused on their customers. Uh, whether, whether you need to pass a law to say that, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, you, well, you only survive in business if you give people what they want and deliver them a service that they want over so, an extended period of time. So the question then is, is the um, 
free market, and I know you're a bit of a, a free market guy, if I, can, if I can call you that, is the market delivering the best outcomes for customers, and, and has it, and arguably it hasn't? Well, 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 no system in the world is perfect, yeah. uh, uh, and you know, we're all humans, and people do good things and bad things. Uh, and so what, what you want is, is a system that holds people to account where they, where they, make, uh, where they don't behave properly, uh, and where, where there's transparency, and where people know where they stand and where there are clear rules that are properly enforced. Mm. Uh, and um, so th th that's, that's, where, that's where we should be focused. Okay, so um, Minister Firefoy has, has signalled that he's keen for a principles-based approach to this. So instead of saying, um, Bank A, you cannot sell this product or you, or you need to do this specifically, the idea or the impression I get is that he's keen for principles. So say, look, okay, Bank, you need to put your customers first and you can sort of work around and, f and figure out how you need to do that. So this is, ju this is just my reading of um, the situation. How do you feel about that, that sort of angle to it? Well, uh, again, um, you know, the, the basic sort of principle should be there should be some um, clarity about what is required as well. Uh, and yes, um, that, so, so that's the fundamental tension that you have in any regulation that you have uh, in the sense that um, yes, you want to set broad principles that people understand. Uh, and the more detail you get into, the more people find their way around it. Um, you know, when I, when I was a minister, I sort of worked on the assumption that half of the regulations that are put before me uh, are likely to achieve the exact opposite of what they set out to achieve. Uh, because life is complex. Uh, people work a way around it, uh, and it, it leads to all sorts of weird and wonderful, unexpected responses. And that's why you've got to be very cautious and careful about how you do it. Go about it in a, lo in, in a careful uh, fashion, asking, uh, you know, working with the sector and getting a clear idea of what the actual consequences of the regulations would be. Okay. Paul, question about KiwiSaver. Do you believe there's a role for the government to play for over 65s in, in helping them manage their money, whether that's through some sort of a decumulation scheme that could perhaps be attached to KiwiSaver or through some other support to say to people, look, you hit 65 or 67 and this is how we're going to help you manage your money? Well, I don't, I, I, I don't see the, uh, a role yet for any kind of government-mandated accumulation scheme. I don't think the sums involved are, are big enough yet, uh, and the, the market can sort it out. Uh, it may well come a time in 20 or 30 years where uh, that, that there may be uh, some room for more detailed work. Uh, I think the main thing for over 65s and KiwiSaver is to uh, enable them, and there's legislation sort of at the moment, to for their their uh, employers to keep, keep on making con contributions uh, and being able to join. A, a lot of people actually use KiwiSaver's accounts uh, over 65 as, as effectively a, a way of saving and, and to be able to get in and out of that is reasonably good. I thought the Capital Markets Review came up with some interesting ideas around KiwiSaver there in terms of you know, uh, thinking about how we can um, create more flex in the system so that um, KiwiSaver uh, funds can start investing in private equity which have, you know, which is less liquid uh, and, uh, you know, rearranging things so that's more enabled. I think that's, that's a discussion worth having. Uh, and over time, I don't, you know, it's not going to affect everybody but I think we should, over time, build more flexibility into the system. Perhaps so that you can invest with more than one provider? Yeah, well, I think that's an idea worth considering, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just a question from, from the audience. Uh, when will national mandate higher KiwiSaver contributions? Well, I mean, of course, uh, uh, this is a financial markets area. You, you're, you're keen on, on more money coming into it, and that's important. Uh, I suppose the thing that we, we balance is... Uh, um, we have a different system to the Australian system, uh, effectively, whereby we don't have a means-tested uh, superannuation. We have a, a, we have a, um, a, a fully funded super scheme, and the idea of KiwiSaver is uh, it is to top it up rather than to replace it. Uh, and so, um, you know, you could go to the 10 or 12 percent if you're sort of having a, a system which is based on people expecting to uh, use that as their retirement and, and only have access to a means-tested one if they haven't got the sum. So it, it is a fundamentally different system. So uh, ultimately, if you're taking money out of people's pockets today, there's a limit. You can do that before they start you know, struggling to pay their bills. So, you know, I think it's about right. You could slowly build it, but I'm not certainly in favour of going up to 10 or 12 percent or something like that. Okay, another question. Given the enormous growth in KiwiSaver funds under management, is it still so important to keep the door wide to foreign, wide open to foreign capital? How do we join the dots here? Well, I mean, New Zealand um, 
has been built on foreign capital right from the very start uh, of, of people coming in uh, from Europe, bringing their capital and trading back to where they come from. We've got another wave of that coming with uh, a Chinese immigration, people coming here, moving here, bringing their capital, uh, trading back with the country that they've come from, and that, that, that is a great driver of prosperity. Uh, and uh, obviously we need to be uh, mindful of New Zealanders' concern around, uh, around land and, and sensitive areas. Uh, but I, I think the, the restrictions that were put on in some areas have been counterproductive and, and ultimately make it harder for us to grow. Because ultimately, if you, you, like I say, where do you get growth, where do you get jobs, where do you get opportunities? You get it from somebody somewhere investing. If we rely purely and solely on our do domestic savings, well, that's fine, we'll grow slowly because there's not much of them. <laughs> if we want to grow faster, we need to import capital as well uh, in order to you know, get the country clipping along. All right, Paul, I think we had the uh, little red light flashing on the screen, so I think um, everyone might have heard enough of it from us. But thank you um, for your attention, and um, also thanks, Paul, for, for sharing some of your, your thoughts with us. And, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And I, I know, I, I just, the only final point I'd make is, uh, um, you know, we're in politics and we think of ourselves in public service and all those sort of things, but I, I, I do come from the, the point of view that um, there's no purer form of public service than being in business and, and surviving every day on the extent to which you give people what they want in order to uh, have them coming back to your business and requiring it. And so that's, uh, that's the work you do and I just wish you all the very best and um, uh, hope, hope the rest of the conference goes well. Thanks very much. Honourable Paul Goldsmith. Look, on behalf of uh, the Financial Services Council Board and my colleagues here today, I want to just say a huge thank you. Uh, you know, we all want a prosperous New Zealand uh, and in a democratic society, it's so important to have people like yourself who've got so much passion and energy uh, for doing the right thing for New Zealand. So, you know, to come and give your time and, you know, to these people here that are also wanting to make a difference, uh, a huge thank you. Thank you very much.